Good evening, everyone. All right. It is so great to see you all. Thank you all for so much for coming out to the Varsity Theater for tonight's LSU Science Cafe. My name is Steve Beck. I'm with the Office of Research and Economic Development. It's my pleasure to welcome you here and to all the people who are online also watching us. Tonight, we have a great program planned for you. Before we go on, though, I do have a special announcement for those of you who have been coming to Science Cafe uh, of late. We have told you that in January, we will be celebrating our 10th anniversary. And we are so excited. We have a special program planned for you. Um, but tonight, we're ready to announce who our speaker will be. We will be hearing from LSU Health Clinical Associate Professor of Medicine and Certified Astronaut, Dr. Serena Arnyarn Chancellor. And she will be talking about her experiences in space and as a researcher and who studies things in space. So I can guarantee you that her talk will be. Can you do this? Oh, that's right. That's right, everybody. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good night. Um, waitresses and Count Laville will be here for Thursday. Um, uh, okay. Seriously, um, plan to be here from 5 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. on Tuesday, January 31st. We are so excited to have this event, and we hope that you'll join us for that time or for that event. Um, tonight's program is equally stellar, and it features some of the research by Dr. Sabrina Taylor, the Weaver Brothers Distinguished Professor in the LSU School of Renewable Natural Resources. She will share her research on the charismatic barred owls, which are the most abundant owls in Baton Rouge. We do want to remind you that LSU Science Cafe's goal is to continue to build a strong, informed community uh, providing access to reliable information, new ideas, and cutting-edge research from faculty researchers across the campus. We are so excited to present this tonight. Uh, tonight's event is being brought to you in partnership with our media partner, WRKF 89.3 FM, and it's my pleasure to introduce the membership manager, Timmy Kelly. I like that woo in the back. Yeah, that was nice. Um, first off, uh, thank you so much for being here. And tonight's speech is a, def a particular uh, special one for me because my high school mascot was the owl. So, uh, you know, yeah, fighting owls, the feathers fly, you know what I mean? <laughs> so, uh, first off, I want to thank you. If you donated to our fall member fest, we not only hit our goal, we smashed it, which is not happening anywhere in the country with public radio anywhere. So, Thank you so much for supporting this important thing to our community. Uh, and uh, I, I want to remind you that we do have this financial literacy conference called Money Moves coming up on November 12th at uh, Baton Rouge Community College. If, if like money is not your thing uh, and you like feel like you need to learn more about it, which uh, FYI you do, uh, this, this is a great, fun, free event uh, for you to attend on November 12th at 9 a.m. to find out more information Go to wrtf.org where you can also become a member. And tonight, Dr. Beck, uh, if you uh, registered uh, for tonight's uh, talk, you your name might get pulled to win this 20 ounce ceramic uh, drinking stein. If you're listening to Morning Edition, it's 20 ounces of coffee. If you're listening to something in the evening, it's whatever else you like to drink. So thank you so much for being here. WRTF loves you. Thank you for your support. Thank you, Timmy. And now it's time to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Sabrina Taylor, as I said, is the Weaver Brothers Distinguished Professor in the School of Renewable Natural Resources at LSU. She received her PhD in zoology from the University of Idaho. Did I say that right? Idaho? Otago in New Zealand. I should, I should go to rehearsal. Um, so, uh, together with her graduate students at LSU, she focuses on conservation genomics research, often on endangered species, including red wolves, gopher tortoises, small-toothed sawfish, 
several species of birds and most recently active tigers in the United States. She has also extensively researched the effects of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill on marsh, marsh rice rats and seaside sparrows, including research on immune gene variation, gene expression, epigenetics, and DNA metabarcoding. She is a fellow of the American Ornithology, Ornithological Society and has been awarded an LSU Alumni Association Raising to Research Award the LSU College of Agriculture Seed Berry Award for Outstanding Graduate Teacher, and two LSU awards for undergraduate teaching. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sabrina Taylor. Good evening, everybody, and thanks very much for being here. I'm very pleased to be presenting this research. Um, is our slide advancer working? Maybe unplug it and plug it back in. <laughs> All right, so we're talking about the magnificent feathered beasts in your neighborhood tonight, barred owls. Um, this is the first time we're presenting this data. So this is what we've collected over the course of four years. So you guys are seeing it for the first time. Now, much as I'm very pleased to be here, I, I can't help but have this sneaking suspicion that I was invited here tonight because owls are such a perfect topic for Science Cafe Halloween edition. <laughs> And so maybe we'll have a spooky night with you. <laughs> you might have to wait for the slides to back up here. <laughs> Keep my eyes. Okay. So a little bit of background about this talk. Um, most research at universities happens because graduate students have a project that they focus on, or there's several graduate students who are working together on a project. This is a bit different. This is just a, a group of us in the School of Renewable Natural Resources who thought that these owls were really cool. And so we kind of did it as a side project. Handy to do with owls because they're nocturnal. So we could do our regular jobs and then go out at night to, to have a look at these owls. Okay, so what I'm presenting tonight is really a, a major team effort. And you might wonder why it's somebody who does genetics is looking at, at owls. It's primarily because over the years I've been becoming increasingly aware that uh, we can't really just stick our wildlife in parks and have our people over here in cities. We have to think about ways to integrate wildlife into our urban areas because people occupy so much land today. I think it's something like 80% of ice-free areas is occupied by people. So how do we coexist with wildlife? Now, a few shout outs to uh, some of the people involved here. The first is this guy, VTech, who played a real leadership role in the study, a lot of energy with the field work. Most of the pictures you'll see tonight are his, unless I've noted otherwise, and also a lot of the spatial analyses are his. I also want to thank the many graduate students in R&R, undergraduates and colleagues who all participated in this many landowners, so neighbors who are very tolerant of us prowling around their yards at night with headlamps on, sticking holes in their lawns. <laughs> Burden, uh, Breck, Hilltop, they all coordinated with us so we didn't get stopped by the cops too often while we were out in the wee hours. The LSU vets who were also really good sports about being on standby and also in the wee hours when the wildlife hospital is closed just in case we had any owl medical emergencies, which luckily didn't happen. And then finally to our boss in r, &R Dr. Alan Rutherford. He was very generous and supportive in letting us uh, do this project and helping us to make it happen. Now, I lastly wanna point out a few people from Team Bard Owl who are in the audience tonight. And if you have any questions, you can also ask these guys. So if you want to raise your hand, I think you're all up in the back table. Patty Rodriguez, Dr. Ashley Long, Liza Stein, Alexander Bresnan, and Garrett Ryan. 
Okay, so what about these barred owls? What are we looking at exactly? We want to know how barred owls are using habitat in Baton Rouge. Oh, that, can you pull that bar off of the top of the slides? So uh, what we're doing is we're catching owls in different types of forests throughout the urban areas. So we're catching them in places where there's only a few trees, in places where there's just little patches of forest, and in places where there's large tracts of contiguous forest. And we wanna know what they're doing at night when they're hunting and during the day when they're sleeping or what an ornithologist would call roosting. Okay, so this is how we catch owls. We use these very tall nets. They're about 30 feet high. You can see Ashley and I at the base of one of those poles, right? We're very short compared to the height of the poles. And then there are nets hoisted between the two nets. The nets are up here. They're quite difficult to see, and we hope they're quite difficult for the owls to see too. Um, but we aren't just hoping that some random owl is going to fly by and get caught in our net. We're also playing owl calls on either side of the net. Owls are highly territorial, and so they're going to come in and check out who that jerk is that's turned up on their territory. So this is VTEC setting up a speaker. And I'm going to play a couple of the owl calls that we use when we're doing research. So the first one is an owl doing its classic who cooks for you, who cooks for you call. This next is a pair of owls hooting it up, caterwauling. It takes a while for them to turn up sometimes on the tape. <laughs> So they do that when they're reuniting after having been apart, or they also do this when they're responding to our playback. This next call is a female shriek, which causes great aggression in bird owls. They almost always come. Oh, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Okay. Female shriek. And then the last of all, if anyone's looking to supplement their main soundtrack, <laughs> these are juveniles. <laughs> Very spooky sounding. Okay, so once we catch an owl, we take a few measurements like the wing length, the tail length, and the weight. And we also have a look at the owl's underwing. Um, so owls put down a, a pigment called porphyrin, and that fluoresces under blacklight. So that 
glowing area in the center, those are new feathers. They've just grown in. That porphyrin degrades with UV light. And so you can approximately age of a feather based on that molt pattern. So a brand new owl that's out of the nest, the whole underwing will be glowing pink because it's just grown in its feathers. Whereas an owl that maybe has a few brand new feathers and older feathers and even older feathers, that would be a third year bird. The other thing we do is sex the owls. So you can tell males and females apart with morphology sometimes. So when females are incubating eggs, they have a brood patch. They lose a lot of the feathers on their abdomen. It becomes highly vascularized and that's how they keep the eggs warm. But females of course are not always incubating. So the other way to tell a male apart from a female is to look at the size. Like many raptors, uh, females are bigger than the males are, but there's quite a bit of overlap. So we can say that a particularly large owl would be a female and a particularly small one would be a male, but we're pretty uncertain when it's a size that overlaps. And so for that, we can use genetics. So this is a page from, um, This is a page from my lab book. So we're taking a small blood sample to sex the owls. Now in mammals, females have two X chromosomes and males are XY. In birds, it's the other way around. The females have a ZW chromosome and the males are uh, ZZ. So on the far right over here, we're looking at a gene that has a different length on the uh, ZW chromosome. And so a female, you'll see two bands, a male with two copies of the Z chromosome would be a band like that. There's just a single band, two copies of the same size. And so they overlap each other on the gel. So we can sex the males and females reliably by doing this. Okay, and then the main thing is to put these GPS tags on the owls. So this is how we're going to know how they're using the habitat in Baton Rouge. So the GPS tag, we've got it set to collect two locations during the day and two at night. The short antenna on that tag, that's the GPS antenna that's taking those uh, location data. And this tag also has a VHF component to it, which you can set to come on in a particular time and day. And so we'd set our VHS signal to come on on Saturdays. We go out and radio track the owls, make sure they're okay. And we can also download the GPS data through that VHF link. So when it comes on, it's emitting a signal, beep, beep, beep. And you can go around with an antenna and find the owl that way. And then the third component of this tag is an accelerometer, which would be similar to what you have in a Fitbit. It gives you information about the owl's activity. So we can get quite a lot of information from this tag. So the tag itself, it's got holes on either end. And through those holes, we put lingerie, elastic bands, and they sit over the owl like a backpack. They cross in the front and they're sewn together with a couple of cotton stitches which will eventually rot so that the tag will come off by itself if we don't catch the owl before that. And I have a tag here if you wanna see it afterwards. Okay, so when we've done all this, we release the owls and check out that wingspan. Owls have very big wingspans relative to their body size. Off they go to live their owl lives and do owl things, right? And we can collect the data on that. Okay, so what did we find? I'm gonna go over four main types of results tonight. So the first will be the owl home range sizes. Uh, the second will be the kind of habitat they seek out and the kind of habitat they avoid. And then we've built a habitat suitability map for Baton Rouge, so places we expect owls to be. And then finally, a bit of information about the activity. So this is one owl um, near River Bend, the River Bend subdivision. And those symbols in yellow are the daytime locations and the symbols in black are the nighttime locations. This is quite a large forest uh, tract. And you can see that the owl gets everything it needs from that forested area, right? So it's got a bedroom during the daytime, those yellow symbols. It's got a kitchen and dining area where it's out hunting and eating and it hardly ever goes into the surrounding neighborhood. 
This is another owl on the LSU lakes at the bird sanctuary by East Lakeshore Drive. And so this is a bit different, right? Owls that only have a really small little forest fragment, they're using that forest fragment as their bedroom. And then they're going out at night in the neighborhood to hunt, all right? So their, their kitchen dining area is a bit different in location in terms of where their bedroom is. And so President Tate and neighbors, you've got an owl with its bedroom across the street from you. And it's out hunting around your house at night. Now with these GPS data, we can build a home range. And so this is the geographic area that an owl is using for all of its daily or nightly needs. So this is a map of Baton Rouge for all 35 of our owls. There are uh, 25 males here, 10 females, and those shapes outlined in um, that are sort of oval-like. <laughs> those are each a, a, an owl's home range, okay? So it's spread out through the city. So we're gonna take a closer look at one of these. That bird down there, that's a bird that we caught at Antioch Boulevard Park. So this is showing three types of home ranges where the owl is during the daytime, which is the skinny solid line, the home range of the owl at night, which is the dashed line, and then the overall home range, which is the thick solid line. And uh, that's combining the day and the nighttime points. So of course, during the day when owls are sleeping, they don't need a lot of space. They typically have a few roost trees that they like to use. And so they don't need a lot of space during the day. At night when they're out hunting, their home range becomes much bigger, right? Because then they're out looking for good things to eat. So what does this look like for all owls? So this is the nighttime home range for all 35 of the owls here. So on the y-axis, you're looking at the individual owls. On the x, you're looking at the area of those home ranges. So that bird, that example bird that I've that's highlighted here um, for the nighttime home range and the dash line. That's actually that bird at the top has quite a large home range relative to the other birds. The mean home range size is about uh, 0.3 square kilometers, which would be about six times the footprint of Tiger Stadium. Okay, and that's by the red line. But it varies quite a bit, right? It's sort of between about 0.1 square kilometers and say 0.7 square kilometers. So during the day, it's much more restricted, right? They're not using as much space. And so the average home range size for an owl during the daytime is more like uh, 0.1 square kilometers, which would be about two times the size of Tiger Stadium. And there's also a lot less variation, right? Those, those numbers are much tighter together, very small to only about 0.2 square kilometers. And still there's a couple of owls that wander, right? So they have bigger home ranges, the ones at the top relative to the others. And then the overall home range, of course, that's a value in between the day and the night. So about 0.23 square kilometers or about five times Tiger Stadium. Okay, so um, setting aside this idea of an owl's home range for a minute, let's think about the land cover in Baton Rouge, especially from the perspective of an owl. So you can quantify land cover using different measures. And so one of the ways this was done was to look at forest versus non-forest cover. And then you can use those data in relation to other types of data to look at at habitat variables. And so we're picking five habitat variables that we think are important to owls based on previous research. One of those is canopy height shown here. So those dark green areas are areas where trees are very high. You have high canopy height. Those brown areas are areas without trees or where the trees are very short. So you can look at the land cover and then you can look at where the owls are. And then you can see whether the owls are using habitat in proportion to what's available on the landscape, okay? So that dashed line that's at the zero mark, if you have a point on that line, that's saying that owls are just using habitat in proportion to what's available, right? So if you had 50% grassland, 50% forest, they would be using 50% of each. When those points start to move away from that zero point, that is when you're seeing a significant preference or avoidance for a certain kind of habitat. So at the top, 
looking at a significant preference for forest proximity, including proximity of zero being in the forest, okay? So strong preference to be in forested areas. Those orange points are showing a significant avoidance. And so there's a significant avoidance for understory density. It's difficult for owls to hunt when the understory is very dense. And so they tend to avoid that kind of habitat. And they also don't like being near forest edges. They would rather be in the center of a forest than at the edge. Does that make sense? So this is showing the overall preferences and avoidances. So we're using night and daytime points together here. You can also split this up for daytime use, which has the same result. When you look at nighttime, um, there is one more type of habitat preference, and that is for canopy height. At night, owls have a preference for tall canopies. And that also makes sense because they like to hunt from a high perch and swoop down on their prey. So using those data on preferences and things they dislike, you can um, apply those preferences and avoidances to a very broad spatial scale. So you can create a map of Baton Rouge and look to see which kinds of habitat an owl might like to be in and which kind of area it would tend to avoid. So all those areas in blue and the darker the blue is, the more suitable that habitat is to an owl. Areas that are in red are areas that are less suitable to an owl. So this is showing habitat suitability at night. And you can see there's a fair amount of habitat around. This is the habitat suitability during the day. And so you can see owls are a lot more constrained on the landscape by the amount of habitat that's suitable for them for the daytime when they're sleeping and trying to rest. So you could think of it as there's sort of a lack of nice bedrooms out there for owls. Mm -hmm. And then if you put that all together in an overall map, this is overall suitability. One of the things to notice is a lot of the suitable, suitable habitat is sort of fringing the area of Baton Rouge. And then the center of the city is where we're seeing less suitable habitat. Okay, so another thing we can do with these data is compare the home range size to habitat suitability. And overall, there is a significant relationship where if you look in that figure on the left, the more suitable the habitat is, the smaller the home range size is. So home range size decreases as habitat becomes more suitable. And that's also the case at night, right? And that makes sense. If you, an owl is in really great habitat, then it doesn't need a lot of space because it gets everything it needs from there, it gets enough to eat, has places to sleep. The daytime uh, graph, that is non-significant. So as scientists, we don't read into that and we just move on. So on to activity. This is that uh, activity data now that we're looking at. No surprise, owls are not very active during the day. So between 10 a.m. and 3 p.m., not very active. Active at night, but something to notice here is that they are particularly active at dawn and dusk. And so in biology, we'd call this crepuscular activity. Those are their periods of highest activity. So we can also look at the relationship between activity and habitat suitability. Overall, there's no relationship, but that's really because the direction of the relationship is different for the night and for the day. So at night, that middle graph, as habitat suitability increases, activity decreases. And that makes sense, right? If you're in really great habitat and you have a small home range, you don't need to be very active. You have enough food around that uh, you don't need to fly great distances to find it. If you're in not so great habitat, on the other hand, then your home range is bigger and you're gonna have to expend more energy to find prey. Interestingly, that last graph that's looking at habitat suitability during the day, we're seeing an increase in activity in highly suitable habitat. And we're not totally sure why this is. This was an unexpected result, but one potential reason is that when owls are in really good habitat, you know, say a large forest tract where they're quite secluded, 
they might feel a little more comfortable about coming down at ground level to hunt, and they do hunt sometimes during the day, versus being in a place like, say, the bird sanctuary on the LSU lakes, where there's people and dogs and bikes and cars around during the day, and they would rather just sit tight high up in their roost tree rather than risk coming down. Okay, so to wrap this up, <laughs> no trees, no owls, right? There is a strong relationship between trees and owls. Those wooded fragments and even sometimes a few big trees in the city are really important to owls. Owls are cavity nesters, and so they need uh, fairly big trees with cavities big enough to accommodate their, their nests and their chicks. Their home range is larger at night than during the day. Right, no surprise there because they're out hunting. And they're most restricted by suitable habitat during the day, right? There's not a lot of habitat on the Baton Rouge landscape where an owl might like to spend the day sleeping. Their home range sizes are also larger as their habitat becomes less suitable and they're expending more energy probably as a result of that. Activity, crepuscular, dawn and dusk, if you want to see an owl, those are your best times to find them when they're flying around the most. And that relationship between uh, activity and habitat suitability really depends on the time of day. So at night, they're expending less energy in good habitat. During the day, they're expending more energy. Okay, so that is where we got with the research, but there are some other things to think about uh, for an owl in terms of the trade-offs of city living, right? So one of these things would be the importance of swamps. We think swamps, which are wooded wetlands, are probably very important to owls. In big forested areas, like on the other side of the Mississippi, where you have big swamps, you have a ton of owls all packed in there. And same with the blue bonnet swamp. The naturalists there keep tabs on about seven pairs of owls that are all packed into that very small swamp area. And one of the reasons for that might be the amount of food that's available to them. So owls eat amphibians, and like a good Louisianan, they are also very fond of crayfish. So this is an owl eating a crayfish <laughs> where they wade in the water to get them. You can see they get their trousers, their feathers wet doing that. And I don't know if they have any crawfish boils, but they sure use the same technique as us by <laughs> pulling it out from the shell, right? So some other things to think about for uh, the trade-offs for an owl of living in a city would be some of the pros that are involved with that. One possible benefit of living in a city like Baton Rouge for an owl is they might be less susceptible to diseases like avian malaria. Avian malaria is transmitted by mosquitoes and we spray in the city to keep levels of West Nile disease down for us, right? To reduce our own infection rates. But owls may also benefit by this if the number of mosquitoes are reduced and so the owls are less infected with avian malaria. Another potential plus to an owl of living in a city is the number of rodents that are around, right? Wherever there are people, there are mice and rats. And there have been a number of studies done on barred owls showing that um, owls in urban areas eat a larger proportion of rats than do owls that live in rural areas, okay? So they have quite a source of food. On the negative side for an owl in a city would be the mortality rate caused by roads. So a lot of owls get hit by cars and are die and are injured. Um, especially young owls, I would say, dispersing juvenile owls. We've seen lots of dead owls out on the road. I think the vet school gets quite a few injured owls. And I think that the Museum of Natural Science no longer takes barred owl carcasses. Is that right, Rob? Because you get so many mostly. <laughs> so very high road toll for owls. Um, another problem they potentially face is poisoning through rodenticides. So when people poison mice and rats in their homes, if an owl uh, 
preys on one of those ailing rodents, it's also getting poisoned. And there have been a number of studies done showing that there are substantial residues of redenticides in owls, in owl livers, so owls that have been necropsied and sometimes fatal doses. So this is something that might be a negative to an owl. So all these things together bring us to this bigger question of what is an urban area like for an owl? Is it a sink where you're constantly getting owls recruiting in from the forested areas, but their mortality rates are so high that they're constantly dying and new owls are coming in to replace them? Or is urban living potentially quite a good place for them in other ways that balances out those negatives? So these are some interesting things that are, we could potentially pursue. And with that, I... Uh, I'm welcoming any questions. Uh, <laughs> and I also brought an owl with me if anyone would like to go out with everyone else. This is our stuffed bird owl, so feel free to come up and see what it feels like. They're very soft. Right, so the question was, how much data do you need to calculate those home range sizes for the owls? And do the owls change their home range from year to year? So uh, when we first started putting tags on owls, we put them on for three months, and then that let us calculate. Um, so what you can do is basically look at how your home range size changes in terms of size, and, and placement with the amount of data that you have, right? And you're gonna to get to a point where it doesn't matter how much more data you add, that home range size and location won't change. And so for an owl, that's more like, uh, I think it was, I wanna say three weeks. And so we started putting these tags on for a shorter amount of time as a result. Year to year, owls reuse the same territories. There have been some territories in other places where the same pair of owls has been on that territory for you know, 13 years. So they're, they're non-migratory, they stick together with their mate and they defend that territory year round. Oh, yeah, go ahead. So the question was, what is the population size of barred owls in Baton Rouge, right? Um, so the urban owls versus the more rural areas in the forested? The short answer to that is no, but if I had to guess, I would say there's a lot more owls out in the rural areas. So for example, um, a. Wilbert's Sons has a forestry track on the other side of the Mississippi, and when we play owl, owl calls there, there'll be like you know, four or five pairs in a very short stretch of road. In the city, we usually scout some of these parks before we go out at night to make sure there's an owl there before we start setting up nets. And if it's a decent sized forest area, there's usually a pair there. If it's only a few trees, then we don't usually see them. You could try and estimate those population sizes with the genetic data we have, but we, we haven't done that yet. So you'd be looking at the effect of population size with that. Yeah. Okay. Yes, so, so the question was, do we have enough data to know whether urban areas are a sink? And the answer is no, because we don't know what the fitness values would be for owls in urban areas versus rural areas. So you calculate fitness by looking at the survivorship and the reproductive success of owls. And so you need to know 
uh, you know, how many chicks they've fledged preferably over their lifetime <laughs> to compare that. But it does mean that you have to find owl nests and track their reproductive success to get some measure of that. And those estimates are really difficult to do when you have small fragment sizes because your sample sizes are so low and you have a lot of error associated with that. Yeah, good question. So predation of, of what eats barred owls, right? So we didn't see any ourselves, but great horned owls are known to be predators of barred owls, um, as are raccoons. The raccoons will often take over barred owl nests. That happens quite a lot at the blue bonnet swamp. And so they, they eat the, uh, the owl chicks or the owl eggs. Yeah, so being out at night is is quite fun. So the question is, um, what are the what are the kind of owl species and maybe even nocturnal species are out, and what do we catch in our nets besides barred owls? Is that right? So uh, we do not catch great horned owls because we're not playing their calls, so they don't come in. We hear them from time to time, but they're not nearly as common as barred owls out at night. Eastern screech owls, we've never heard them when we've been out owling, but I was just speaking to somebody in the audience uh, tonight before I started speaking who had one in her backyard actually, which is a bit unusual for urban areas. Some of the other things we see at night would be things like um, possums and armadillos and flying squirrels. There's quite a few flying squirrels around. They have very high pitched squeaks and they sometimes do get into our nets, but they almost always get out by themselves. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so the question was how to support Bardell populations in Baton Rouge. So I would say if you have a problem with rodents, use that trap instead of using rodenticides, that'll help with mortality. If you have a big enough property for trees, grow some trees. Owls love trees. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, so the question was which net catches owls, right? Uh, so it's a net that has, it's about my height. So we have two nets on top of each other on those poles. Each one is about my height and they have uh, two panels each and it looks more like a fishing net. So the mesh size for owls is quite big. It's probably like that. What makes a net more efficient? Having one that's the right size, if you have a net with a mesh size is really small, the owl will bounce out, right? And if it's too big, they, they won't get caught in it. So the question was, what are the interesting things are there about owl anatomy, you know, apart from being able to spin their heads around 180 degrees, right? <laughs> so the wingspan is really big, you know, it, it helps them hunt in forested areas. Another thing that I think is really interesting about owls is the asymmetry of their ears. So one will be up here, the other will be down there. It helps them to better triangulate their prey. So they're very, they're very offset compared to our ears. And they have Excellent vision and hearing. Oh, yeah, sorry, go ahead.
So um, let me know if I heard you correctly. Uh, would wildlife corridors be beneficial to owls? Is that right? Yeah, I think it would. It would. Well, so owls can disperse pretty well. You know, they're really excellent flyers. But if you had a few corridors around, you'd have more forested area, and that would give them more habitat to occupy. Yes. Yes, they do. So the question was, what's it like to hold a barred owl and do they try and bite you? <laughs> yes, so you hold the, the owl by their legs. Really, the talons are the most dangerous part of an owl. They're razor sharp, so sort of a triangular shape and the center is hollow. So it's like you have two little knives running down the side that just slice through things like rodents. They need to have good control over their, their feet and their their leg muscles are very strong, right? So you need to make sure you have a good grip on the owl. When we catch an owl and we're measuring it, we also put a cloth bag over its head. And that seems to be something that universally calms birds down. It's kind of like, you know, people putting blankets over their canary cages and the canary thinks it's night. And so they, they settle down. I don't know why that works for a nocturnal owl, but it does if you put it on top. Yes. So the question was, um, how do owls interact with other animals? So, uh, you know, they're, they're predators for one. So they would go after <laughs> rodents, uh, amphibians, insects, crawfish, right? They can also go after quite big prey. They can go after birds. Um, and I think the biggest bird they, that's ever been recorded for a barred owl is a red grouse. So quite a big bird. In terms of the biggest mammal a barred owl has ever been recorded as catching, that would be a, a rabbit. So they, they have a whole gamut of different kinds of prey. And from an ecological point of view, they are predators. So they're quite high up in the trophic web. Yes. Uh, yeah, so good question. Are owls a protected species? Barred owls are not a protected species. They have quite large population sizes throughout the U.S. And so they, they are not. Uh, spotted owls are. And then in some other places, short-eared owls. And I think uh, snowy owls might have some protection in, in Canada, but at a pretty low level. Yeah, uh, so the question was, what's the average weight of a female owl and a male owl? So female, so, so out of all the owls that we've weighed, males and females, their weights range between about 650 grams and 1,000 grams, which would be about one and a half pounds to two and a half pounds. For females, that can vary tremendously. When they are incubating, they lose a lot of weight, like up to 30% of their body weight. And one owl that we caught at Hilltop, the first time we caught her, she weighed 850 grams. The second time we caught, and that was in March, so she probably had a nest. The second time we caught her was in October, so her are gone. And we couldn't actually weigh her because she was heavier than our scale of a thousand grams. So she was out feasting once she was through raising her chicks. Uh, yeah, so the question was, what was my interest in owls when there's all these other species out there that are of interest, right? Well, I am actually interested in a lot of different kinds of owls. I'm kind of a mile wide, inch deep sort of person. You know, I like looking at a lot of different variety. The owls specifically, it's just that I have never seen so many owls in a city as Baton Rouge. And I thought it very interesting that there's so many here and how we can have so many here. And one of the reasons is probably that Baton Rouge is one of the most treed cities in the US. And so 
there are a lot of owls because of that. And also just the number of swamps that we have here, the kind of habitat they like. I can't see anyone on that side. <laughs> oh. Yes, the question was, did we name the owls before or after we caught them? It was usually <laughs> after we caught them and after we knew they were going to keep their tags on because sometimes they <laughs> just pull them straight off. And so some of them is based on behavior that our kraken just ripped us to shreds like it <laughs> got everybody. <laughs> I actually can't remember off the top of my head. Owl crowd, does anyone remember where we caught Icarus? Nope, nope. There were two owls that were quite interesting though, who had big home ranges and they, so the very first owl we caught actually was right outside our department. And that owl would range between that forested area just north of Bed and Her Road and Aquaculture and uh, town Baton Rouge. And it would go back and forth between the two. And there was one other owl like that who had that kind of behavior. Most owls mostly just stay put on their patches. So those were a bit different. Yeah. Yeah, uh, so the question is, can you tell the different calls apart? And yes, like well, after you've heard them a million times on a tape, you <laughs> yes, you can. So, um, you know, the regular uh, who cooks for you, who cooks for you, all that's like a territorial call. That caterwauling is usually when the male and female are reuniting, you know, if, if one is coming back from foraging, or it's also used in territorial disputes. And then there's one more, we were trying to catch this very wily female who, I think she just lets the male get caught in the net and then she spends the rest of the night going around it because she knows where it is. So we tried putting the male out of sight so that she would come looking for him, <laughs> maybe hit the net. And so her call when she was looking for her male was that call that they do, like the kind of, where are you, multiple times, right? Yes. Uh, yeah, so the question is whether hurricanes have an impact on owls because of the damage that's caused in the habitat. I'm sure that's true. I haven't seen any data on that, but in some ways it might be a good thing for owls because when trees get snapped off and branches get snapped off, it creates cavities. So I, I, I wouldn't say that's all bad. <laughs> yes, how did we name our owls? So it was so funny. I think, um, how did we do that? Oh, I think it was whoever radio tracked it uh, for the first time when it kept its tag on, that's when it got its official name day. So whoever was out radio tracking that day got to pick the, the name. <laughs> yes, a whole variety of names in there. Sorry, yeah, go ahead. Uh, so the question is, what's the lifespan of a barred owl and are you seeing multiple generations? Is that right? Yeah. So over four years. Yeah, so I think the oldest recorded owl in the wild was um, 17 years. So they're quite long lived. And there are there is some evidence that sometimes um, there is sort of intergenerational 
territory holdings. So when the parents die, their offspring will take over that territory. Um, and there are definitely cases where owls reuse the same territory year after year after year. So four years, that's most likely the same pair of owls that's on your, your property. 40, oh, no, those would be different ones, yes. <laughs> Yes, yes, you're, you're, yeah, no, those would probably be different owls. It's probably, you, yeah, you, let's say you've maybe had four different pairs through there, maybe on average. <laughs> but if it's a nice, if it's a nice habitat, they're going to move in, right? Oh, uh, one, do you want this to be the last question? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so do barred owls share their nest cavities with any other species of birds? So usually a, something else would take over a barred owl nest, either when it's done or if it's kicked it out. So like a, a raccoon might take over a barred owl cavity. I don't know if great horned owl is doing that, but there is one study where a barred owl and a great horned owl had uh, territories that overlapped a lot, but based on radio tracking, they basically avoided each other as much as they could on that territory. Yeah. Uh, yep. What gives owls a really good night vision? I believe it's that nictating membrane, right? Like, Mark Mitchell, wildlife vet. Owls have two fovea, which gives them their, their excellent night vision. So, thank you. Yes, Alexa. Yes, so the question is, we've got a big discrepancy in the number of male owls that we've caught versus the females we caught. That's not reflective of the actual numbers of males and females that are out on the landscape. It's just that we tend to catch the, the males more than the females. Almost every owl that we looked at was paired up with another owl. Yeah, good question though. <laughs> so, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, so before we go, a couple of things. First, the lucky winner of tonight's uh, WR drawing is uh, a lady Cringer uh, Kriegler. Kriegler, there we go. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you all so much for coming. Next month, we want to see you here, back here on November 29th for a Science Cafe talk by Don Davis, who will talk to us about Asian Cajun shrimpers. Should be a great trip and get you thinking about that stuffing. So until then, a happy Thanksgiving to everybody. Thank you all for coming. We'll see you next month.